I'm leaving that meeting a little early because I have a, a commission meeting to chair at, at 10, so others are still considering the conversation, but I, I don't believe it will uh, change the outcome, which is we don't have any resolution, and uh, they're sticking with uh, what they their position, I'm sticking with mine, and uh, they said they would file, uh, file papers this afternoon. That's for them to decide, and frankly, for them to uh, determine, but that's just where things stand at this point. Well, we had, a, we, had a, we had a candid discussion of uh, the back uh, the circumstances that led to where we are today. Anything else? Was there any, any movement at all, uh, Governor? Did you detect it? I would say there wasn't any movement in terms of anything that that uh, would change change the where things are. I would say there wasn't any movement on, on both sides. They will I come out to whatever we talk to. I know that you are penalizing a certain group of state employees because you want to tax more and spend more. I mean, I, they can say whatever they're going to say, then they will. Um, I take very, you know, seriously the effect of uh, anything that causes people to be, be laid off, even on a temporary basis. That happened to about two thirds of uh, the governor's office staff in 2011. Happened to several thousand uh, state employees. I believe it was over 6,000, uh, and it was very painful and very difficult. And I'm talk with a lot of people who are going through that and afterward. Uh, again, I say the legislative leaders have the uh, ability uh, to uh, come to the special session and resolve matters so that those layouts won't occur. So, I mean, if they want to continue the, these discussions and, and with a goal of achieving that, then I, w I would welcome that. But that's, uh, that's their, their decision to make, not, not mine. I line on veto uh, within my constitutional authority. And the consequences of I had uh, not signed the tax bill as they put in, snuck into their uh, state governments is that uh, about 1,200, 1,300 revenue employees would have been laid off. So, you know, this is uh, something hopefully we can look for and look at in the future. You know, the, the putting of policy measures into these budget bills is, is putting a gun to the head of the executive branch. If you don't agree to our budget, then we're going to force a shutdown, which is what happened in 2011. Uh, anybody in my position who, who's gone through that and, and all the turmoil it causes and all the disruption in the lives of, of state employees, but also the citizens throughout Minnesota, uh, and, and would know that, as I do, that's virtually un unthinkable to, uh, to repeat. And so. This, uh, and I don't know what the remedy is, but to have, well, the remedy is not to have policy in the budget bills. And the remedy is to get the budget bills and the tax bill done uh, enough in advance that, for example, we can get a 10-year analysis of the impact of the tax bill on the state of Minnesota, which we, I didn't have until a week after the legislative session. So, I mean, there are these kinds of defects that are uh, contributing to the predicament that we're in today, but those are for another legislature another uh, year, another discussion. I do have to go, I'm sorry. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Well, good morning. I haven't seen a number of you uh, for a little while, but uh, uh, we wanted to meet with the governor. The governor invited uh, the speaker and myself and both minority leads to come in and uh, see if we could find a solution uh, to end this stalemate. Uh, in the end, uh, I don't think we're any closer to any solution. Uh, I, the House and Senate uh, will move forward with a lawsuit. Uh, effective today. We'll, we will have that filed. Uh, if we can still find a solution with the governor, we will certainly do that. We would prefer that. Uh, but we're not going to give up on some of the, the issues that we all agreed to uh, moving through the session and, and the bills that were signed into law. And so that's where we're at right now. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's any more that I can say other than that. So I think we had uh, expectations that uh, hopefully the governor would have had a change of heart in his approach uh, this morning. Uh, it doesn't appear that he has. 
uh, the, the five provisions, I think it's five provisions, uh, that he would like to renegotiate or change uh, in, in the bills. Um, as far as we're concerned, um, goes back on the word that he gave us that he would accept those provisions. Um, so we're not, uh, you know, we're not open to that. Um, we still hope that we can find a solution uh, to solve this problem without uh, court intervention, but we certainly feel like we need to protect the integrity of the institution of the House and the Senate of the legislative uh, branch of government. Um, we feel that that is uh, important and uh, we will pursue a, a court option, a legal option uh, to preserve uh, that, that co-equal branch of government, um, that, uh, that complaint. Uh, uh, we did provide a copy of the complaint to, uh, uh, to the governor and to the legislative uh, leaders as a courtesy this morning. This will likely get filed in district court later this morning. Um, and, and we're hopeful that uh, the courts will take a swift and firm action uh, to affirm the, the, uh, the co-equal branch of government that the legislature is. Um, I also want to go back to uh, just read a quote very quickly. Uh, these were the governor's words in his uh, vetoing of our original public safety omnibus bill, uh, where he said, and this is the governor's direct quote, I strongly believe in the separation of powers among the three branches of government. It is not up to me or the legislature to second guess what the judicial branch needs to maintain a well-functioning court system. Um, I think you could uh, substitute judicial branch for legislative branch, uh, and, and hopefully uh, the governor would appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the co-equal branch of government that the legislature is the same way. Um, unfortunately, uh, he's not living up to what his own words are. Um, so we're very disappointed in the action that the governor has taken and, and certainly uh, feel it's our, uh, our, our obligation to our employees and to the legislature and to the state of Minnesota uh, that we protect the legislative branch in court, and we will do that. Do you feel pretty good about your position still? Are you as confident that this is close to a slam dunk as you You know, thought? we do feel good about that. Uh, back in 2011, uh, the courts deemed the legislature to be essential. Um, if you look at the governor's veto letter of the state, uh, uh, the state government uh, finance bill, uh, which is where the, the legislative funding was that he line item vetoed, um, that letter, he did not specifically say he had any problem with the legislative funding, um, that he was using the legislative funding to as leverage for other things. And we think that's a violation of separation of powers. And, and frankly, um, you know, we hope that the court uh, understands that while it might be the legislative branch's funding that's uh, in jeopardy this time, next time it could be the court's uh, funding. And, and frankly, I think the courts will side with protecting a co-equal branch of government. We're pretty confident about that. So I think a, a lawsuit should be avoided whenever possible, which is why we took slow steps to get here. Uh, we, the Legislative Coordinating Commission met and we have picked an attorney, but each step of the way we were trying to, trying to find a way through this without having to go that step. We had this meeting today, even though we would have filed last week, again, hoping that we would not have to take this step. But we're at a point where we just don't feel like we're going to be able to move forward, and so the lawsuit appears to be the only direction we have at this point. When will you notify staffers they will be laying off? Well, our hope is that we don't have to lay them off. We'll have to figure out funding. Uh, one of the other issues I'm, I'm concerned with in the Senate is if we have a Senate building that we have to make payments on, the payments over a year's time are about $8 million. Uh, we will prioritize our staff over the building. Uh, I told the governor that, that it's more important for me that our staff, both Democratic, nonpartisan, and Republican, are taken care of. And we'll just figure out you know, where can we go and how much money do we have and when will that end. But that's why we're starting the court case today, because we're going to ask for a temporary restraining order uh, that we can move forward, that we can still function as we always have. How long can you go? Same question on the speaker. Uh, if the funding indeed goes away on the first Well, it's, it's only a month or two unless we can figure out some other way to do it. And, and again, uh, you know, we're hoping that the courts side with us at the very minimum, uh, a temporary restraining order so that we can function uh, as we were meant to function. You know, we, we probably can operate uh, somewhere between two and four months at full funding. Uh, we have a plan uh, that we're uh, close to approving 
um, that would operate the legislature in, in pretty much its, its full capacity, or excuse me, operate the House in pretty much its full capacity um, for at least two months and then we'd start to kind of wind things down. Um, I think the problem becomes this, the Senate will uh, uh, run out of money before the House will, so uh, hopefully the court will take action prior to either of those things happening. But uh, frankly, we're, we're, uh, we take this really seriously. I mean, there are, you know, I think about 450 staff between the House and the Senate. Uh, those people work awfully hard uh, at the legislature. Many of them are nonpartisan employees and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we feel like we need to protect them and, and as well as we can and that's why we're pursuing uh, a, an option through the courts. Senator Gonzalez, if I can follow up on the Senate building, are, sure. you, saying, are you planning to close the Senate building? Uh, so we're just we know that of our budget uh, roughly 32 million about 8 million is for the building and uh, we are not going to prioritize that over our staff and so we'll have to wait and see how that plays out I just wanted the governor to know that my people are more important than the building and from there we'll just have to decide how it is but we're going to prioritize people first whether they evict us or not I don't know I mean that that is an issue that we have to explore I mean we but we're not going to jeopardize our staff over that building. Well, that's well, that's okay. Okay. Did you notify staff on these scenarios and what they can expect? We have not yet. We are waiting for this meeting today. Again, we, we have been slow to this point, uh, but we now we know we have to move forward. If we get a temporary restraining order, that changes everything as well, so we'll have to wait and see. Would this include the state office building too, or just the... Uh, the it, obviously, the, the new Senate building was built more recently and, and has an outstanding bond payment. Uh, the legislative appropriation does not include money for the state office building. Uh, the state owns that building, and, and, and it's operated uh, by the Department of Administration. So the funding for the state office building is not in jeopardy. Uh, and and uh, I, I think the underlying uh, question here is, uh, if we default on bond payments, um, on, this, on the Senate office building, it could impact the bond rating of the state of Minnesota. Um, and, and I think that's an important thing that we need to realize. This isn't a political game that just might affect a few politicians. Uh, this affects our employees, their families, and, and ultimately could affect all Minnesotans um, if the legislative branch is, is grossly weakened by this action that the governor has taken, or if the bond rating of the state of Minnesota uh, is, is uh, jeopardized because of this uh, this political action. You can do this, you can do this unilaterally because it comes out of your budget. Is, the, is, the Senate, uh, the payment for the Senate building is included in the Senate's budget, which was line item vetoed. Well, how does it affect the bond rating? Will one default, will one um, missed payment signify default? How does this affect the bond? Uh, some of the Senate research has told us uh, that even one payment default would affect it. So I, we don't know that for sure because we've never been down this route. I'd rather not be down this route. Uh, if we can find a way not to do that, uh, that is my hope. But uh, if we don't have any other choice, then, then that will be well, impacted. Is it, is it important enough to agree to a special session so you don't hurt the state's bond rating? If, if we could agree to, for a special session, for example, one thing that was talked about is that we solve the pension issue. That was a bill that did not get signed. Uh, that both sides wanted. I would be open to that. We're just not going to give up on some of the small tax relief items. Uh, and keep in mind that the $650 million tax bill, only a little over $400 million was actually revenue reductions. The other, other parts of it were more spending, local government aid, county program aid. That four-year number of revenue savings is about a billion dollars compared to spending increases will be six billion dollars more over four years. So we're not talking about reducing the actual, the, the small amount of tax revenue reduced already. We're not going to take away from that. But maybe we can find something else, and so pensions was one thing that we talked about that we would do. We're, we're looking for a way out of this as well, uh, but not lowering the already small revenue reduction. You talked about taxes there. Is that a suggestion that the, the talks they were focused on this to do Cigarette tax, uh, smoke back tax provisions, and not some of the policy provisions that the governor also mentioned among his body. Yeah, that's normally what I've heard, uh, and there's been two inflators that he's brought up uh, the tobacco inflator and the business property tax inflator. So keep in mind, neither one of those are, ta are revenue reductions. We're just saying future increases in those taxes uh, we should not do. And I, I will tell you, I had the, a former uh, DFL tax chair saying we shouldn't 
do inflators. Inflators is not good tax policy. So we're just saying let's leave what we have in place. If we want to talk about some other bill, like pensions, we would be willing to do that. And so when you say we would still like to avoid a legal remedy, there's room for talks on a narrow subject. Yeah, I, I, we are absolutely willing. We, we always have been. We always will be willing to, to find a solution to this that doesn't include uh, going to court. Um, we, we hope that we can still find that. It's difficult for us, however, to uh, change these items which the governor already agreed to. And, and there were concessions made in negotiations uh, on both sides to get to the agreement. Uh, those things were all part of the agreement and the governor agreed to all of those provisions. Um, you know, going back on that after signing the bills, uh, we think is, is going back on the governor's word. And, and frankly, uh, if there's one thing that needs to be, uh, that needs to mean something around here, it's got to be your word. Um, and we took the governor at his word. We believed when he said, I agree to those things that he did. Um, he obviously has changed his mind about that and wants those things changed. Um, however, uh, if he wants to change those things, then we probably would want to change a lot of other things. And then the entire thing falls apart. So um, we think it's, it's best to just leave the agreement the way it was um, and try to find a solution that, that doesn't include the governor going back on his word. One, one other thing about the overall spending and tax relief plans, that's all signed, it's all into law, none of that's going to change. Spending increased 9%, and, and we are not trying to take away that, nor are we trying to take any of the tax deductions away. And so we want to leave all that in place. It balances this budget cycle. It balances two years from now. So we don't feel like we need to change that uh, as we move forward. What responsibility do you folks have for, as the governor says, hiding the treasury of hiding something in the state department's bill, the state government bill, uh, forcing the black man into signing well, you know, the, the provision that was in the state government finance bill, uh, we viewed as a necessary insurance policy, uh, not, not to force the governor to sign anything. He certainly still had his constitutional right to sign or veto uh, either the tax bill or the state government finance bill. Uh, but remember that a year ago, the governor said he supported that tax bill. Um, he then uh, took some time, I think five days, to find a one-word error in it, uh, which could have been fixed five different ways, probably, maybe more. Um, and then he vetoed that bill. And, and frankly, uh, we believe that after years and years of, of record surpluses here in the state of Minnesota, that, that Minnesota taxpayers deserved uh, to, to share in some of the prosperity that they helped create for the state. So that tax relief bill, while it was, you know, uh, of the money that was uh, spent this, this particular uh, uh, budget cycle. I think it was $12 of spending increases for every dollar of tax reductions. Um, so we think it was incredibly fair. Uh, but, but uh, you know, the, the, the governor obviously, um, you know, didn't like that provision, but it was, was not hidden in the bill. He certainly knew about it, had every opportunity to know about it. Um, we let them sign off on the bill before it was posted publicly. The bill was then posted publicly for 39 hours before it was voted on. Um, so everybody had the opportunity to read that bill and know that that provision was in the bill. Um, and frankly, uh, in hindsight, it was the right decision to put that provision in the bill. Because of the governor's actions, I can only conclude uh, that the governor was likely not to sign the tax bill. And I think that would have been incredibly uh, unfair to the Minnesotans who have worked so hard to provide this prosperity here for the state of Minnesota. So um, I, I think it's just, uh, I think it was the right move to, to, to put that in the bill. Um, and the governor had an option. He could have signed those two bills or vetoed those two bills. And he made the decision to sign them, which is exactly what he, we thought he would do. So if I can add to that one too. So if, if we had had all the spending and none of the tax relief, that would not have been a win for, for our side of the aisle. We want a tax relief to farmers, to seniors, to students with loans, small business owners, et cetera. And we were looking for a win-win. The governor wanted more spending, more spending than we wanted to give, but we gave that. In return, we expected the tax bill. And so, and the one thing I would say that I, I wish had happened different is, uh, like the speaker said, he had that, that bill 39 hours ahead of time. Uh, had he known about it, we still would have passed it. It just wouldn't have passed on Thursday. It would have passed on Friday. So that's the only difference there is, is uh, he did not bring it up. 
and so we didn't discuss it, uh, but, but in the end, uh, I think it still would have come forward. It just would have been a little different, one day different. Senator, you're going to file this in Ramsey County Court, and does it specifically ask for a temporary restraining order, order as the first thing? I, I, it's, it's in Ramsey Court, but I don't have the exact details. We were waiting for this day. I was moving forward thinking that we'd find a, an off-ramp. We didn't find an off-ramp, and so we, we now have to strategize, but it will all happen today. Was there any budging on either side? on this, uh, about his five items that he wants or anything? Not, not from the governor. I think perhaps some people around him might, might have been open to something else, but not from the governor. Are you expecting, I mean, after you file, if the judge grants a temporary restraining order, are you expecting this eventually to go to the state Supreme Court? I know that it can and probably will, but I don't know that for sure. I've never been down this path before. I don't think anybody has. So. Should it end up there, though? Is that the appropriate place? Well, I, I think if we're going to do this, I'd rather settle it once and for all. Uh, I don't think any governor should be able to defund a House, a Senate, the Judiciary Branch. I think we're, all of those are important. Uh, so that would be my preference is that they settle it uh, now that we have to go this path. Will we get the copies of the You will when it gets filed, which I think will probably happen within maybe even within the hour. Yeah. So it'll be happening fairly shortly. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, Have a good thank day. You.